Welcome back to Drive Your Thoughts Podcast. I'm your host, Master Coach Carrie Marshall, and it's time to go after those goals. Yeah, whether ready or not, life's coming hard, no breaks, no stop. And if you put me on the spot, don't get it twisted. I never drop. If you feel a bit out of control and out the box, here's a way that you could drive your thoughts. Turn this podcast on, it's a lock. Carrie Marshall. Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm so excited for my guest today. Now, Jaron, you and I kind of know each other, but it's in kind of a different world. Like, I think we met through couples, right? Yeah. Uh, Probably the Sperry's, I would assume. Originally, or even Jerem and Jill. Yeah, or Jerem and Jill. Yep, yep. So we kind of met through that. Um, And then, you know, both of us are authors. And so we've kind of helped each other on a couple of projects a little bit, just kind of, you know, back and forth with that. But let's start out with who are you? You know, I I like to tell, I was just telling uh, off before we started, like, I like to know you as an author and probably the best person that makes reels on Instagram. Sweet. <laughs> that was that's how I would like to introduce you because if any of you any any of you follow Jaren on the Instagram, you need to. His reels are amazing. They're so much fun to watch. And I appreciate that. So tell me a little bit about you now, though, from a different perspective. Uh, who are you? Tell us a little bit about your family, because I know that that is a huge pride for you. Right, absolutely. So originally from Southern California, um, grew up there, Laverne, and high school graduate. I didn't realize where I wanted to go, end up applying to one college only because my brother did, BYU, and got accepted. Not sure how. I had a great GPA, failed, bombed SATs, literally. I think they're out of 1,600. I ended up getting an 880. Oh, wow. Honestly, I think I missed a missed a bubble and just went, anyway. And so, it just went off from there. It, it, you missed one missed, bubble and you're done. Exactly. So they, <laughs> they accepted me. Probably felt bad for me. But came up here to BYU. Um, loved it, actually, except for the snow. Still don't like the snow. I don't ski. I don't snowboard. I don't embrace it like everyone else. My... I think snow is a good place to go visit, not live in, but that's me. So anyway, ended up uh, up here for a couple of years, went on an LDS mission to Portugal and Cape Verde, came back, ended up uh, running into my soon or wife at the time, about three months later. I uh, wasn't expecting to meet her that quickly, but we dated for about a year, got married and settled down in Orem. And after that point, we got, uh, today we have four kids. We have a 16 year old. Uh, twin girls that uh, are, will be 14 in May, and then a boy at the very end, he'll be 12 in August. Um, but you know, I just talking like whether I had a boy or girl, number four, like that was it. I tell Nicole, like, four is the final <laughs> score. I'm not going to find out 12 dollar daughters later. I got no boys in me, right? Right, so but no, it's great just to have the girls, the boys, you get a little bit of everything. That's awesome. Um, other than that, though, we uh, you know, how it is, you just stay busy, you know, it's a busy time. We have, we have kids really similar ages. Ours is 15, 14 and 12 or 11. So oh. really, really similar ages. Yeah. And you know, it's so fun though. I mean, this, this stage of our lives, we are just soaking it up. It's so much fun. Especially vacations, right? Oh, you're not dragging kids. There's no like nap time. Nap you got to stop what you're yes. doing. Like, everybody's on the same page. For yeah. the most part, they're getting along. They're doing fun stuff. So I think that's our favorite thing is watching our, our daughters like, you know, cause friends are gone. There's no, you know, boys to kind of, well, not boys right then to distract them. So they get to hang out together. And that's been so much fun to watch our girls just like create awesome, awesome memories on vacations. Right. And girls are hard though, right? It's like, I didn't realize how tough it is. Not that your daughter, our daughters are hard, but just society today. Like it, it's a hard time to raise daughters, find good friends, things like that. So I'm, I'm learning a lot. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. The dynamics of girls are definitely different. You know, that's one thing, Curtis, Curtis, we have all girls, but that's what he said is he's like, I didn't realize how different it would be to raise girls. And, you know, he loves raising girls, but it is, it's a challenge um, we, my daughter and I went to Texas to go and try on prom dresses, just her and I, and, uh, Wait, we you went were, all the way to Texas just for that. Yeah. Yeah. It was so fun. So I decided that this year I'm going to take each of my girls on a different trip every quarter or one of them on a trip okay, every yeah. quarter. So my first one, I was like, what would be fun? And my friend lives out in Texas. So she's like, come out and do prom dress shopping. It's insane here. And I was like, cool. So we did. But it was very interesting. It's Curtis's first time watching his daughter try on dresses and things. So we're sending him pictures. And he's like, 
uh, can we put that hem a little shorter? Yeah, can, too much or, skin. Yeah, too much skin. Can we, you know, get this? Can we get that? And so it was really funny to like. That's a good dad though. Yeah, yeah it is. It's a good dad, but it's kind of fun to watch him become a dad of teenagers now. So. No, that is awesome. You yeah. guys are great parents too. But other than that, um, love tacos, right? Got that <sighs> from my mom. Uh, love sprinkled donuts. Grew up playing soccer and baseball. Used to play soccer until I tore my ACL about two and a half years ago. And then you kind of maybe retire the jersey. Um, love Scrabble, chess, anything that requires skill. Very competitive. But other than that, you know, life is good for us right now. That's so cool. And so one of the things that you do is you're an author. Right. So let's talk a little bit about that because I know that that is... Number one, you have a book coming out. Right. I have it on my Amazon. Love it's, it. It's coming. I'm so excited for it. But how did you start the writing? How did you get started writing um, from the very beginning? No, good question. So I probably, and I thought about this, like my love for writing probably came from my love for reading. So ever since I remember, I loved reading books, especially as this author called Matt Christopher, right? He had these Fictional books, but they're sports books. The the fox who stole home, the kid who only hit homers, uh, tough to tackle, all different sports, right? And I just remember just going to my room sometimes and just literally diving into these chapter books, only about 100 pages, and just becoming the character. Like when the character stood to the plate and I could feel the anxiety and, and when he hit the home run, the rush, the adrenaline, right? And I would just become my imagination would just go into these worlds and I would just lose track of time. And I could even taste the chicken dumpling still to this day when like the author described it. So I just got really into reading, which just kind of, I think expanded my imagination. So fast forward to, um, it was college. I think it was my junior year. I was taking an English class and we had to write a paper on history. Well, first of all, I am not very educated with history. Like I just, I don't care. Right. I, I get it. You asked me about wars. I don't even know who fought in them. And that was literally one of the, the questions that we had to write that research paper on. It was history, which war? So I started Googling stuff and all of a sudden I come across the Cold War and then I'm just reading about it. And then I see Dr. Seuss's name. I was like, that's kind of weird. So I start researching it more and it comes to find out Dr. Seuss ended up writing a book, children's book about the Cold War. Do you know which one it was? No. The Butter Battle book. Oh, I don't Have think I've ever that read that. Uh-uh. So it's like the Ukes and the Zooks. So anyway, he writes his book at the time that the Cold War is still going on. He doesn't finish it, right? So um, I, I asked my teachers, like, listen, here's the scenario. I love to do this. And she says, yeah, no problem. So I end up finishing the book f- for him, so to speak, right? Because he didn't know who won the war. And, and I'm getting an A on the class. I've gone back to try to find if I could, that part that I wrote, it was probably horrible. It, it probably just rhymed. The meter was off. But I think that's what kind of sparked the ceiling in me for the for the writing. And then fast forward a couple more years later, back in 2010, um, I was meeting with just a bunch of guys. We met like once a, a month just to kind of go over goals. And for some reason, Carrie, I wrote down, I want to write a children's book. And um, at the time, Kennedy was three, the twins were one. And maybe that was just on my mind. You're just doing so much kid stuff that you're just constantly thinking of kid things. And... I don't know what it was. I still can't remember this day, but I just took it seriously. Literally from that day forward, I just dove headfirst into it. And I haven't looked back since then. That's so cool. And so, like you said, like it was kind of that spark of actually taking something that you didn't want to do, which is write this paper, but then to kind of like change it into something that was interesting to you. Um, You know, what do you think as a kid, what do you think kind of helped you love to read? Was it just the stories and your imagination? It was the stories. You got to find the right ones. Like Castle, for instance, like I've struggled trying to find him the right books that he likes. Like I I kept all those Matt Christopher books. I gave them to Castle. I was like, dude, read a few of these. There's some some soccer ones in there because he's a huge soccer player, but he just wasn't feeling them, right? He likes this this different genre. I'm like, that's totally fine. Find what you like. So people who say, I don't like reading, I think a lot of times it comes down to, you just haven't found the right book yet. Once you once you find what hits you right here, then it's game over. You're going to hope that there's sequels and trilogies and everything else. But it, it does come down to finding what just resonates with you. That's so important. And that's what I found with my kids too, is, you know, I'm an avid reader. I love to read. I'll read anything. But I had to find the right books for my kids. And that has included 
I don't know if you use thrift books or not. I love yeah. thrift books. It's just like cheap books. So I will buy hundreds of dollars worth of books trying to figure out what my kids will want to read. And it's been hit and miss, right? Right. But it has been so fascinating to see which ones they're drawn to and how different all three of them are. I still haven't found the one for Curtis yet. <laughs> I got one for him. Okay, good. <laughs> you were working on it yeah, a couple months ago. But no, I, I am a big believer in in helping your kids read because it's not so much reading. I mean, obviously, yeah, you're learning words, spelling, but it goes beyond that. Like when I think about confidence as me as a kid, that's where it came from is because you you read like this kid's literally just hitting home run after home run and you start to think if he can do it, I can do it. And it, it really planted that seed of confidence for me of, I can do this. And it's weird, right? It's a weird concept to, to understand unless you just really get into the reading. But it, it just does so much good. Creativity to the, just the imagination and how much creativity and imagination we use today as adults and where it can lead us. Well, and I think it's really cool to be able to read a book. I remember being able to read a book and we're, I was reading about a little girl my age and it was her inner thoughts, right? And how she was scared and nervous and timid and how everybody said she was shy. And I was like, oh my gosh, it's me. But it was really cool because I was like, where else would I be able to get into somebody else's mindset that's that age and be able to identify with it? And so that's what I really connected to was finding that like, how I can see somebody's inner workings of their brain in the pages. So that's been really cool. You know, I have one one daughter that's very... uh, she, she says she's not a good reader. Best thing that we've done, and her teacher told me, is she said, buy the hard copy and buy the audible. And then she said, and she will just start tracking, tell her, your job is just to listen and track. She's become such a good reader. That's awesome. And I was like, what? How cool is that? We didn't really have that, you know, books on tape when we were right, kids, exactly. probably. But it's cool to be able to think, like, when we're telling ourselves, like, our kids don't like reading or it's too hard for them. There's so many different things to do there. So, all right. So I wanted to know, so you've kind of talked about your kids being in a certain spot. Like, so that's why children's books kind of came up. So why then, how did you start from that time of like, I want to write this children's book. And then what happened after that? No. Okay. So it was about 2010. Um, I, I wanted to write children's book. I like Dr. Seuss. I like the rhyming, right? I felt it was just like a fun extra dimension to, to children's books. And so I literally just started writing. Like I just thought, what was the first idea that came to mind? It was called Zag and the Dragon, right? It's basically about this, this kid who his grandpa tells him these bedtime stories and, and his grandpa throughout the process, this kid becomes part of it, just like how I was like, I'd become part of the story. So, but literally the, the, the boy would become the main person in the in the story, and I started there, and it was rhyming. And um, I take it to my group of guys, say, "Hey, what do you guys think of it?" And you know, I don't think they're they were going to judge it too harshly. But looking back at it now, because I've kept them, it was horrible. Like the meter was off. And what people don't realize is when you're writing rhyme, there's three things to it: the syllable count, which is easy; the rhyme, that's easy to do, but it's the meter. So and, explain the meter a little bit for people that like aren't in yeah. this in this place. Yeah, hopefully I don't bore them. It's like, who cares about the meter? <laughs> I so, do. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of different types of meters out there. Dr. Yeah. Seuss and I and I use it too. Is what it's called anapestic tetrameter, like the cat in the hat. So it's basically an unsyllable, uh, soft accent by a hard syllable count by a soft, soft, hard. Right. So think of. Um, the same book would be Twas the Night Before Christmas. So Twas the Night Before Christmas and all through the house. That's the meter. And that's what's made Dr. Seuss one of the best children's book authors of all times because anybody can pick up one of his books and just start to read it and they catch it. It's, it should sound like a lullaby. Books these days that are rhyming, and, and I'm a harsh critic, like I don't know how they got published because the meter is horrible. Right? You're stumbling and fumbling and, and you're like, I, I, I don't get it. So I had to start learning that. Like you're literally, I'm just, you're reading books after books that are rhyming, a lot of Dr. Seuss books, and you're, it's a lot of messing up. It's a lot of messing up, trying to figure out, I, I'd have like this web page up on my computer that I was able to look up where the hard counts are and the accent syllables on the words, because I couldn't tell still. But then over time, you start to hear it in your own head. You're like, that, that's, that word doesn't work. And so over the course of a couple of years, um, I get to the point where like, hey, I probably got about 10 manuscripts done. I was like, I got to find out if any of these are good. 
So my first one was the Tooth Fairy called Flight of the Tooth Fairy. It went through literally three different start from scratches where I just like, this isn't working. And I finally came up with the version that I thought was my winner. And so at that point, um, well, let me back up. During this time, I go to uh, this writer's conference. It's done by a lot of uh, BYU teachers, other teachers. It was awesome. And, I, and that was the point. And I heard about it on a radio station. I was like, I have to go there. It was in Sandy. And you know how it is, Gary. Like when you invest in something actually like financially, you take it a lot more seriously. And that was the first time I said to myself, well, how much, how much do I want to do this? Right? Because it... You know, I wasn't making a lot of money back then. It was probably 500 bucks, but more importantly, I had to take a whole week off work. Which is a big deal. It is. And you start to think, okay, how much money am I now forfeiting? And Nicole's right. like, are you sure about this? And I was like, yeah. She's like, okay, go for it. She was always super supportive. So I go there and that's probably really where I was like, this is awesome. And you learn so much, the, the inside rules, the children's book that most people don't have any clue about. And getting that insider's perspective. You know, when you are in a group of people that are passionate about what you're passionate about, it just sparks something in you right. where you do get to, for a week, it sounds like, just immerse yourself in the, instead of like, oh, I'm going to do it after the kids are in bed or, right. <laughs> but to be able to be in that environment, I bet was just amazing. You, you, it, you just fuel the fire and you just see the bonfire and the energy, the excitement. You have somebody teaching you who has published books so it's not just some pie in the sky. You're like, I can do this. And it does build your confidence again because you're seeing other people struggle. And you're also saying, hey, I think my manuscript's a lot better than everyone else in here. And and they're published. And you're like, you know, I think mine can do yeah, this. <laughs> yeah. So, but that was the point probably where I says, I can do it. And so anyway, fast forward, I end up taking this, this manuscript. And the boring part about trying to get published is the trying to find agents, right? You're, you're sifting through websites. You're reading all their bios. You know, usually an agency has 10 to 15 different agents. You have to read each one to see who's even accepting picture books. So it's time consuming, mm -hmm. super boring, but you got to do it. And so I came up with my list of about 50 to 60 and I submit it one by one. And you just sit there and wait. Most of them say, if you haven't heard back from us within three to four months, just consider a denial, right? I mean, they don't even have the common courtesy to email you a standard right. one. It's kind of annoying. Um, so probably a month goes by and I get my first email super excited. I, cause it says, you know, regarding fly of the tooth fairy, I open it up and there was my first denial. I was like, well, I figured I've got, you know, 49 more to go. Like somebody's going to like this, like this is money. I've, I've re I'm reading everything else out there. Nobody else has the tooth fairy book that describes all of her magic from the moment that a tooth loses his tooth or her tooth. And so you, you know, every day you're checking your inbox and one by one, those, those, um, those denials keep coming and coming. And at that point you start to think, maybe it does suck. Maybe I don't have what it takes. And um, probably within four months, I was denied by every single one. I'd say 25% actually sent me an email saying, hey, and they try to be nice. It's not what we're looking for. I'm sure you'll find a place for it. But the rest of them just don't send you back anything. And that point, you know, you just, uh, You've, you've spent years now and hours and hours of, of trying to master this craft. And you just take a huge idea, at least take a huge confidence blow. And so I talked to Nicole, I was like, what do you think? And she says, you got to keep trying. So then I take my other manuscripts, completely different ones, right? And I submit those. And there were probably about three different manuscripts I submitted, four in total. And I wait probably another six months and one by one, those get denied. And so care by this point, I'm probably literally like over 200, my worst batting record ever. Right. Like I, I couldn't, nobody would accept me if I played baseball. I know about batting averages and you try to read these stories about, you know, JK Rowling and she was denied 15 times. I know Dr. Seuss. I mean, I know he was denied, I think it was about 12 times. I know the exact instance of where he got lucky. Somebody picked up his manuscript because he was literally walking on Mulberry Street, which one of his books ends up being that, right? Yeah. And the guy asked him what he's up to. He's like, I just got denied. He's like, let me take a look. I actually work for a publisher. And so you wonder, like, maybe I'll get lucky like Dr. Seuss, but you're like, wait a second. Like, I've gotten denied 15 times more over than both of them combined. Like, th this is not happening. And so you just, uh, I remember at the point, I was like, well, in those moments, you just, 
Like, how much do I believe in myself? There's a quote that says, when 99% of people doubt your idea, you're either gravely mistaken or about to make history. And I think, Jaren, these people have got to be wrong. Like, what I've written is not crap. Like, I know. I know what's out in the market right now. I've got to keep going. So now I'm thinking, think differently. I'm going to self-publish this. If they don't believe in it, I'm going to self-publish it. So I end up finding the illustrator, go through hundreds of, of portfolios, find the best one. He's awesome. He catches the vision. And that's a whole different story of how that happened. So I end up, he ends up designing everything. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to go self-publish this now. But there was a little, there's something inside of me that says, no, Jaron, wait. I says, okay, I'm going to go back now and resubmit it. Now that I have illustrations, maybe these agents just were up in the night. They didn't catch the vision. So I'm going to go back and I end up resubmitting it to all these agents again. It's called the dummy book, right? Mm-hmm. With the illustrations. And one by one, they deny it again. And just for that flight of the tooth fairy book is denied over a hundred times. How, so, did, how did that feel to like come back after the first round of rejection? And, and you did, you felt that intuition inside you say like, okay, let's not self publish right now. Let's wait. But what did that feel like to kind of go back out there knowing that there's probably a, at least a couple more rejections coming? Um, you start to become numb to it. Mm-hmm. Um, you start to build a little bit of a, a thick wall of, of rejection. You, you understand it's going to happen again. But I just, for some reason, I just held on to hope. Mm-hmm. Um, I just got, I can't go O for 100. It's, somebody has got to see the excitement and the vision. I mean, I even create these, I research the statistics for for kids losing teeth, right? I mean, literally... The, the tooth fairy gives out about over $300 million a year for teeth. I was like, I think it was like three and four households have kids believe in the tooth fairy. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, somebody had to believe. And so you just hold on to that, that one little thread of hope. Mm-hmm. Um, and like you said, you took action, like you got an illustrator. So now you have the dummy book. And so you're like, okay, maybe the words weren't it for them, but maybe now seeing the illustration plus right. the words right? Like this has got to be it. So, so more rejection, then what happens? More rejection. And at this point you, you, you start to go through all these different emotions, like from I'm being pissed off now. Like I'm right. seriously to the anger. I am keeping track of every single person's name mm-hmm. that has denied me. So one day when it becomes a New York best time seller, I'm just going to throw it in their face. Now, obviously I'll feel mature by that point <laughs> and I don't, but I think that's a really good point to bring up because I think that that's sometimes where, you know, when we're talking about the success that we have, we forget this part because I do think that this is part of being creative is that I think we all go through this space of like feeling rejected, feeling hurt, feeling angry, and then feeling like maybe we want to be, vindicated at some point right yeah exactly but i think it is important to be like yeah at one point i was pissed off because we all go through that for sure yeah we do and i definitely had my my fair shares of emotions like i've if anything has made me cry the most it's probably been my books i mean i got emotion a little bit ago but it the more you invest in something the more you come tied to it you become emotionally attached to it and it writing has, has been such a big part of my life like you know i wrote when my kids were asleep I wrote with the hope that when they were in kindergarten, first grade, like I'd be there reading my book to their class. And when when it's when I started in 2010 and it's 2022 when I when my book finally happens, like that's that's uh, 12 years, right? And none of my kids are reading picture books anymore. And that sometimes when I think about it, that um, that still gets to me because I missed out on the opportunity to read my books to them during the age they were reading picture books. But again, it's things happen for a reason. Now they, they're able to say, hey, dad, that's not a very good book. Go with this one instead. But when I get that too much thought, it does sadden me a little bit. And it, But sometimes it's good to be ignorant because if somebody came to me that had a crystal ball and said, hey, Jaron, you're going to start in 2010. You're not going to get anything published until 2022. I would say, hell no. Like and yeah, it. and here's all the rejection that's going to happen in between. Yeah, I think a lot of us would have tapped out of our dreams. Yeah, if we would have known what it would take and what would what it would really look like, like you said. Yeah, it wasn't the overnight success success I was hoping for that you hear about, 
but I ended up going a different route. I started, I figured I have to network. You can't go straight to the publisher. So I started networking and my illustrator actually put me in contact with someone who put me in contact with somebody else who ended up becoming my uh, my publisher, right? They, they caught the vision. They have a little bit of a different setup. So there's some pros and cons to it. But I just felt grateful that somebody believed it enough to say, let's go for it. Mm-hmm. And so we just get my my second books coming out in another about two less than a week, two weeks. And, you know, you just hope that at this point you just keep going and going and get the word out. And, and so how did uh, it feel to have the Flight of the Tooth Fairy finally published where it's on Amazon? You know, I know that you did a book launch, uh, book signing at a toy store. I think right, that was. Yeah, was. How did that feel to actually be able to now see it come to life? I think the mo- the moment I got that box in the mail from the agent, that was a that was an emotional de- moment of being able to finally hold something tangible. Because until that point, it was manuscripts, it was illustrations on a computer that you're approving. But finally, being able to hold it in hand, that's a magical moment, Gary, of just finally seeing all of your sacrifice and and fruits come to fruition. Mm-hmm. Um, so. It's still magical today. Like every time I look at my Fly of the Tooth Fairy book, like I still fall in love with that cover. Oh, it's gorgeous, by I, the way. He, he, the illustrator did such a beautiful job with it. The illustrator did such a good job with it. It's so gorgeous. And and then you get into the book. Uh, like you said, I've never seen the story of the Tooth Fairy told so beautifully. Thank you. Like I, it's such a, like you mentioned with a book, it's such a journey and the the pictures and and then knowing you and kind of the backstory of it it's just so incredible so you. so you get to that point you've done it right right what makes you want to do it again <laughs> well i already have all these manuscripts right i don't want to be the like the the singer that's a one and done like right. a, a, a vanilla ice right? although that's an awesome song i was song. gonna say no no disrespect to else, vanilla yeah. ice we're all in for it yeah. what other songs has he written right <laughs> right um but i mean don't take me wrong like i'd rather have one and none so right. but it's i had um, a few other ones. I literally have probably about 25 manuscripts today. Oh, wow. Don't get me wrong. They're all ready to be published. I probably have five that I believe in enough that let's go get them. But then I was like, okay, I want to go do another one. Like you got to start building the snowball effect. I want to be an actual author. Yeah. Right? And actual authors have lots of books. I, I, my goal is literally to surpass Dr. Seuss. Like you got to put your dreams out there and you got to work towards it. Now, whether that's however happens, like I don't care. Like that's my goal and I'm not going to stop until I'm dead doing it. Right. And so I figured, what's going to be my next book? And it was, it's one coming out. It's called, I Hope You Will Know. Because The Flight of the Tooth Fairy, it's a niche book. Like if, and again, it comes back to when I started writing it, all of our friends had kids in that age. Absolutely. Now that it came out, it's like all of us are older. (laughs) Kids are past the point. We all have teenagers now. Yeah. They're like, yeah, that's a cool book. But, um, so I was like, I need something else. And now it came back to Dr. Seuss again. Do you know which Dr. Seuss's book is the most well sold popular book out there oh i don't know yes um i actually wouldn't know which one it's not green eggs and ham that's my favorite okay it's called oh the places you'll go oh uh, that's what i was going to say i would say oh the places you'll go next for everyone that gets it when they're graduating high school it's good for kids right to the graduations to everyone else and so i started thinking i want to write a book that's like cross age dimensional that doesn't have a limit of just small kids and so and then i started thinking and it's kind of a a, a, i don't want to say a dire dark thought but it was like if i like passed away tomorrow like i would want my kids to know what i stood for like what i wanted for them in life right and so it started going down that that uh, road and then i just thought of what are like the top 10 to 12 traits, personality things, things I want them to, to accomplish in life? And so I started taking each one and just creating a simple stanza for it. And so that's what it came up with is I hope you will know. It's basically all the dreams and wishes we have for any loved one, whether it's a parent for a newborn to a, a kindergartner or to your college graduate, high school graduate. It's it, There's stanzas in their care that are good for you and me. Like one's called uh, Hold On to Hope. That is probably one of my favorite ones. It says like, um, at times there is thunder and skies become gray and the wind begins blowing your kite far away. Just never lets go of the very last string for one thread of hope is a powerful thing. And that probably summarizes my, my writing career, if that's the right word, is I always just kind of held on to that one thread of hope, hoping 
that I would get published, that I would be able to start connecting with people and people would resonate with, with what I'm writing. So that got me. I mean, that's so powerful because in that, in that, like you said, in that stanza is everything that we want for our kids, right? Right. Because you and I know what's coming for our kids. Yep, we do. <laughs> we know what life is. And, and, you know, we, I think when kids are younger, sometimes they think, you know, oh, high school's hard, but then at least I get to go to college. Well, college is hard, but then I yeah. get to get married. And then, you know, it's, it's a happily ever after. And it's like, no, you need reality you, check. You, reality check. There's obstacles and struggles and dragons and all of it through all of it. And, but if you have hope, I think hope is what helps us find solutions, right? It does. It's kind of like the, the founding attribute. Mm -hmm. I think of hope and faith as one, gratitude and discipline. For me, those are the three founding attributes that everything else builds upon. That's so true, though. I think, like you said, hope and faith are definitely tied together. And gratitude, I've always found that if I'm struggling with something and it feels so heavy, gratitude always, always helps with it. And discipline's then what actually helps me get out of it, right? right? Yeah. But I, I think that when, you know, I was talking to Curtis the other day about just watching uh, young adults struggle right now. And it's because they're missing one of those three things or all of them. When you really come down to it, if the kids are dropping out of college or, you know, struggling this and that, it's like, well, do they have hope and faith in themselves in the process in their life? Do they have gratitude for what they do have or do they have discipline enough to show up for their life? Yeah. And I think that that's where a lot of this younger generation is struggling. So parents, just look at those three things. There you go. <laughs> that's how do you help? This is kind of a sidetrack, but how do you help build those three things in your kids? Um, well, obviously there's no rule book. I'd, I'd probably add it. So there's, I always tell my kids, there's, there's a few things I always want you to make sure you know without any doubt. And one, obviously that your mom and I absolutely love you. And that's for any parent, right? Any parent loves their kid. They have to show it. I just did a, a little poem the other day about, you know, the best way to show or to show the love is that what well, I don't even remember now, the best, <laughs> the best way to, to express your love is to show it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But love and then confidence to me, mm -hmm. it, it comes down to building their confidence. Mm -hmm. So how do you help your kids actually gain that confidence and show them that support? Um, so there's a, there's a phrase in book writing that says, show me, don't tell me. Right. So I could say, Carrie, the boy sat and cried. I just told you, right. Or I could say the boy slowly slumped to the ground and buried his face in his knees as the tears gently fell down his, his cheeks. And I'm showing you how sad the boy is. Right. Um, and I think that's what it comes down to for kids is, is showing them in life what you hope for them to, to become and to accomplish, right? So um, every, every Father's Day, Mother's Day, when we're eating dinner together, and Nicole started this, which I love, we go around the room, the kids, all of us, and we say something we love about that person, right? So if it's Nicole, we all build her up and all, all I mean, she's got probably a, a, a list that's 10 times as awesome as my list because you usually have to think a little bit more about me. But without fail, when it's, it, when it's Father's Day, and they're trying to tell me what they love about me. They always say, Dad, I love, I love how you didn't quit and following your dreams of writing. And um and and obviously it makes me feel good, but it's like they're seeing it. That they're, they're seeing that your parents won't ever quit, not on you, not in anything in life. And so I hope they remember that moment that when if they ever want to quit themselves, that they don't. They're like, no, dad tried to get his book published for 12 years. There's no way in heck I'm gonna quit now. It's only been three months, right? Right. Um, I think it was Andy Andrews that says, you know, the a leader a leader's not there to struggle for his people. He's there to encourage them to struggle and assure them that the struggle is worthwhile. And so as parents, we can't fight our kids' battles for them. Some of them we can, but for the most part, we have to give them the tools necessary so, so that they can fight their own battles. But the more we build them up, the better chances they have of being victorious, if you will. And that a lot of times comes to building their confidence and the time. There's this cool little story about this dad, right? And he wants to, um, his boy wants a bike. And instead of buying it, he goes out there and about 
every every day him and his boy in their garage start building this bike. And sometimes they have to go to the store because they're missing a part. Well, this goes on for literally like two weeks and they're spending about an hour a day. And finally the time comes that the bike is done and the boy gets on his bike and he just rides off. It's beautiful. Well, in the meantime, there's this neighbor who's literally been witnessing this every single day. He's always outside watering his lawn or whatever. And he ends up going up to the dad and says, hey, listen, like, I don't get this. For the last two weeks, you and your boys spent hours upon hours, more money than you could have just bought it for cheaper. He says, why didn't you just go buy the bike? And the dad turns to this guy and says, I wasn't trying to build a bike. I was trying to build a boy. And that, that story is always resonating with me is, is how are we building our kids up? Like, and that always requires time. Like we have to show them. We can't just tell them what to do. We have to show them. And I think for me, that's such a more powerful lesson that our kids often don't hear what we say, but they see what we do. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, to answer your question, I mean, confidence, um, giving them the tools, loving them unconditionally. I mean, those are just two starting points. Yeah, we always say like giving them the space to fail and and learning how to come back from it. So, you know, I always tell my kids like our our job as parents is to help you fail fast so that you can gain confidence through it. And then, you know, success is just around the corner or whatever. But it's been fun. I mean, this this week is the end of the term for um, two of my girls. One of them wants a 4.0 so badly uh-huh. and just she's stressed out. She's got a 3.7 or something, which is still awesome. Oh my gosh. It's me. I, I'm like, should we tell her we've never done that? Yeah. As, uh, and she, and he, and Curtis said, and I want to fix it. You know, I want to go and just say like, you know what? It's fine. She like, let's celebrate her even. And Curtis said, no, he's like, she needs this. Yeah. And he's like, I have every confidence that she's going to figure it out or she's going to be disappointed and learn from it. Right. And I, As much as I'm such a champion of that, it's like crushing me inside, (laughs) but I can see that, you know, and I've, I've watched her have so much drive and just, I mean, so just going after it. And I'm like, this is pretty freaking awesome to watch a kid. And even one of her teachers said, I've never seen a kid this dedicated before. And, and she's like, it's just insane to watch her come up and, why did I get this wrong? What can I do better? What can I, I'm like, that's pretty cool uh, confidence that she's building, that she knows that she's got her own back. And so the end of the term is on, yes, tomorrow. And I'm like, let's just see, like, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Oh, and, but and that is awesome. That's a goal. And they probably got that from watching you and Curtis, your work ethic. I mean, work ethic is so important these days, mm-hmm. but even Anyway, but yeah, 97, that's awesome. I, I, I have a little quote that says, um, fill your kids' canteens up with so much love and confidence that there's not even a room left for a droplet of self-doubt, right? So you you and me and our kids, like we constantly got to be pouring that canteen so that the world can't break them down. Yep. Um, I'll, I'll use me as a bad example. So every, and, and Nicole's brought this to my attention, which is awesome, right? Because we always have that improvement as a parent but there'll be some times over the past year and just probably happened about two months ago that my girls will be late for school i have to take them well if they're late for school that means i'm late for the day getting to work blah 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 and sometimes they i get in the car and i just rev off right like literally like rev off like to show my frustration like, hey girls you got to be better on time like get up earlier don't let it snooze um and and they would text Nicole afterwards, like I dropped them off and, and I'm not yelling at them. I'm saying, hey girls, I need you guys to be a little bit more in time, please. And, um, but it's a nice, nice stern voice, right? Um, but Nicole, she, she brought to my attention, she says, Jaren, like you've got to realize like the way you just start off their day, what do you think is going to happen at this point? Like our job as parents is to try to protect them as much as we can and build them up, right? And the world, the moment they walk out that door, the world is going to break them down. It is going to break them down. It's going to try to defeat them. And if I'm helping that, then I'm failing that part as a father. Like I have to make sure that I keep them upbeat. So at the moment they walk out my door or my car door, and I always tell them three things, be awesome, be cool, be kind, right? And I need them feeling that positivity, that energy that, hey, I can go to accomplish the world today. I know I've got three tests, but I'm going to go ace them all. 
And so it was a learning curve for me to say, Jaron, like our homes have to be their safe haven. They have to be that refuge from the outside storms that are coming at them, that are beating down the door, that the moment they walk in our house, they feel that sense of peace. They feel that happiness. They feel that love. And if I'm not contributing to that, then I need to check myself and, and do a better job. So that was for me, again, sometimes you have to be that bad example. So parents yeah. out there listening to this, yeah. like build your kids up. Your house, you've got to be that safe haven. It's, I think there's a quote that says, um, bricks, bricks and stones may build a house, but love and dreams will make it a home. Mm-hmm. Well, and I love to think about creating, you know, we always talk about that safe haven as our home. The one thing that really helped me out uh, recently was I started to think about my safe haven in the car and the safe haven as far as am I a safe place even for friends. And, you know, when I see my kids' friends during the day, if I happen to be at school, like, am I that place where they know that they can come and be loved and accepted and it's a safe place? And that really has just helped even my energy, you know, I had to go to the school the other day and I was like trying to go through all my stuff. I was like, okay, okay. And then I thought I might run into a kid that might need a safe place. And so I had to kind of check myself, change my energy. And I went in and there was a kid in the office. I didn't know who it was. It it looked like he was struggling though. You know, I didn't know who he was, but I had a couple of minutes where I could just sit down and be like, I don't know you. Are you okay? No. Hey, what's going on? You know? Yeah, I'm never going to see you again. And he just kind of opened up for a half a second. I was able to tell him something and he said, I hope I never see you again because I'm really embarrassed that I told you that, but thank you. And I was like, cool. But that being able to be a safe haven for any kid, so powerful. That's so cool of you to be able to be kind of in tune, to recognize your surroundings, recognize that that facial expression, that kid doesn't seem right. And then just to go up and say that, I mean... That, that could have literally turned his day upside down, like especially these days. You don't know how many, there's so much depression, discouragement, and we know where that can lead to. Yeah. That sometimes that friendly smile, that say, hey, how are you? Like, yeah. I care about you enough to at least ask you, even though I'm a stranger. Yep. Like, that could have changed his, his entire journey that day, so to speak, Carrie. So one, I applaud you for doing that. And that's awesome. Like, you're like Nicole, like you're the fun mom where everyone wants to come over. I mean, there's so many times that our girls uh, friends will tell Nicole about their first kiss that just happened because they're too embarrassed to tell their own mom, which I think is sad. And again, we're not trying to judge. Everyone's going to parent their kids differently, but I love how Nicole has that ability and that openness and that love that friends feel comfortable telling Nicole about it, where she can share in their excitement, yeah. which also means that when your kids are struggling, guess who's going to come to you, you and not some other mom. And yeah. you want to be that mom that's, Hey, I'm not going to get mad at you. Always be honest with me. Yep. But like, dude, I'm your mom. I'm your dad. Like, come talk to me. Like, let's work through this together. Yeah. And I think that it always just like we always say, like, we want it to be a place where our kids can come to us or our kids can go to our friends. You know, we're always telling them, like, we're a safe place. And look at all of these amazing parents around you that also care about you. So now I want to kind of switch gears here because there's something that I want to talk about that, um, you know, I've got a, I've got questions about from other, other kind of people, but how did you kind of build on your creativity as a man? Because sometimes what I see is that men kind of hold back right. on creating things, you know, they're willing to go to work and do things and be creative, you know, work on product at, at that, but then outside of work, hobbies, that type of thing, how did you kind of foster that creativity in yourself? Um, that's kind of a hard question. I think in every, I think some generally are just born with a little bit more of a creative gene than others. Doesn't mean you can't learn it. It just comes a little bit natural, right? Like I'm not, I'm not a very good, great conversationalist. I literally run out of stuff to talk to people about, and I just start talking in my mind because that's why I end up going right. Well, um, that's the best conversation. You absolutely. And I, yeah. Plus, nobody can ever argue yeah, with you. Yeah, I was gonna say down. it's the best place. Yeah, yeah, yeah should, for sure. <laughs> awesome conversations in my mind, but I mean. If I think about where I am today, it's probably because of of what I did as a kid. I mean, I remember my dad helping me sculpt trees, right? Trim them. He says, you got to visualize that branch missing. Mm-hmm. And so you start to walk around and you visualize it. Is that the right branch to cut off? So now you got to start creatively imagining things like that. So I remember taking the art merit badge for scouts, right? So you're working on your art. 
Um, I remember always loving to write poetry in high school um, to writing books, of course. So I think you start to foster a little bit at a time. So I would suggest for anybody is just to kind of get outside your comfort zone. Like, let's say you're starting off today at ground zero, zero creativity. Okay. But I, I do believe we all have a little bit in there, but let's say you're just the, the Joe Schmo or the Mary Jane has zero creativity. Um, I'd say and this, this may sound silly and lame, but you gotta, you gotta start off with different stuff. So I say first, maybe go inside your closet and just like visualize different outfits. Mm, that's start, a good one. Starting to visualize outfits. Yeah. And then maybe go on a walk around the neighborhood. I want you just to pick one cool aspect about of each house or landscape job that stands unique. Okay. So now you're trying to get creative. Like what makes this house a little bit more special than the next? Um, I say go to like a museum and just appreciate art or go make sure you're going to your kids dances so you can appreciate the lyrical music and their dance moves and the flow and try to like put yourself in and put your phone away and literally just concentrate on that um i think there's just little go go grab a poetry book and just start reading poetry and see where it leads And i think little by little you're teaching your mind to be to think outside the norm right to start thinking what do i see here how do, how do i feel about this and i think those creativity seeds start to sprout a little bit but then you got to keep watering them, right? You got to give them some sunshine. You got to then make yourself vulnerable. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's not there's not a guy out there that's too manly to write poetry, right? Give me the toughest lumberjack, and I bet we can still make him a, a poet out of it. And so I'd say just make yourself vulnerable, put yourself in those situations, stretch your, yourself for creativity, and you'll find that you do have a creative gene in there, and then you just exploit it. Like you don't have to be creative in everything. Mm-hmm. I'm certainly not. But you find that one that one avenue where you feel like, hey, I am passionate about it. I feel like I'm exceptionally talented at it. I can build upon it. Mm-hmm. And then you just tackle it. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Curtis and I will go to like one of those painting classes, you know, mm-hmm. and I'm like done. Like I'm like, I'm like, I can't do this. It's like hard. He is over there mixing colors and like textures. And I'm like, and then we look at, you know, it'll be that one where we're both doing the same thing. Uh-huh. I'm like, mine looks like a paint by numbers <laughs> <laughs> and his looks like some depth and some emotion. I'm like, how did you do that? And he's like, I feel the same way when you write. He's like, I can't do what you do that way. But I think that that's when you talked about being vulnerable. I think that that's part of it is allowing yourself to go out and play, you know, allowing yourself to go out and explore some things that maybe you didn't know that you had you know, I think as adults, we just don't play enough anymore. We don't. We're, we're afraid, right? We're, we're afraid, yeah. We're often afraid. Mm-hmm. And when you start that one thing that you want to do and you're not very good at, like, don't compare yourself to the professional, right? right? The professional at one point in time was an amateur. Mm-hmm. And that's what we have to remember. The teacher at one point in time was the student. Mm-hmm. You have to start where you are. And it, at that point, it just comes down to discipline and sticking with it, whether yeah. you... I think you had a definition. My definition of discipline is doing what you should do when you should do it, whether you want to or not. Yep. In writing, there's a lot of times I don't want to write. And if you create these inside rules that you have to live by. So for me, it's like I can't go watch a, a TV show unless I write X amount. you got to create whatever rules. that Whatever you have to do that day that you love, create the rule that you can't do it until you do that one thing yep. and you go from there. That was our family motto growing up, exactly what you just said. That was our family motto that we had to live by. And it's been so impactful for us. Like just to be able to say, like you said, like I'm going to do it regardless. There's days that I sit down and the entire thing is probably going to get deleted, uh-huh. but it it's out there. <laughs> it is. And you're fleshing out the crappy ideas. I was right? going to say, I and I have to get the, cra- yes. Yeah, for sure. Cause you, cause a lot of times the crappiest ideas will lead to crappy ideas, which will lead to decent ideas, which will lead to good ideas, which will lead to great ideas. So we yes. call it the, the bad to best, right? Yeah. But you got to flesh it out and then you'll find that, that, that gemstone amongst the haystack. I mean, yeah. Well, right. and the other thing that it helps me do is when I write the crappy stuff, I, sh- I see that I know what's crap and what's not. Uh-huh. And so then when I write the crappy stuff and I go back and read it and I'm like, yeah, this is crappy. I'm like, so what's good? And that question helps me to then write the next the next step. Which and is, if you keep track of it, though, you can see how you're progressing, though, as yes. a writer. Yep, exactly. Exactly. My crappy stuff three years ago is very different than my crappy stuff now. <laughs> 
All right. So tell me what you want success to look like in the next several years of your life. Okay. Um, I mean, I think success has a lot of different faces to it. Um, really what it comes down to me is one is one finding, finding my purpose and passion in life, right? Being happy in who I am today and excited about who I can become tomorrow. Um, success is also marriage life. Like just still being absolutely in love with Nicole of looking forward to the hot dates, um, of just stretching each other, of, of not having it awkward just because we don't have our kids around now. We don't have to, we don't know how to communicate anymore. Right. So making sure Nicole's super happy and our, our marriage is awesome is, is successful to me. Obviously like you and I have talked about kids, right. Is have having happy kids who are excelling in the things that they love kids who still love us right? Kids who want to hang out with us on a weekend. I mean, how rare is that for a lot of people? And, and don't get me wrong. Friends are important. I want them to go have fun, but like them not feeling bad that, Hey, like I want to go hang out with my mom and dad. It's a Friday night. I don't care what my friends are doing. If, if you can reach that point, then you, then you know, your kids, you're, you're communicating, you're connecting with your kids. Um, I love to see my books obviously happen. Um, I love to see them on the bestsellers list. It's, it's not so much about the recognition, but it, to me, it means that that I'm connecting with people, mm-hmm. that they enjoy my stuff, and obviously the, the financial success. You know, you want to be able to always uh, take care of your families, your family. You want to be able to not just provide the needs, but like when there's a want, like not think twice about it. Um, so that's that's kind of just a, a roundabout way, um, but I think what really it comes down to is happiness. Is having that genuine peace and happiness to me that's that's success. I um I mentioned earlier. I, so I served the LDS mission in Portugal and Cape Verde. Right, Cape Verde at the time was part of it, and those are the islands off the west coast of Africa. And I was there for six months. And I'll tell you, Carrie, easily the poorest place I've ever lived in. Right. So imagine rocks were all their most of the houses were built of rocks, so where wind could sift through. Um, they didn't really have a, a water filtration system. So they'd have these, these gutters on the top of their houses that when the rain fell, it pour into like a pit and you'd have to throw your bucket down there. And sometimes you pull the bucket up and there'd be dead lizards. Um, you're talking about really nobody having electricity the, they'd make about eight to $10 a day, but they were some of the happiest people I have ever met. Genuinely happy in life. They, and again, this is in 2000, right? Where maybe the technology wasn't as advanced as it is today, of course. But they didn't, they didn't need the TV back then. Even, even they didn't really have lights. They had lanterns. They, they had simple stuff. Nobody really had a car. You had two to three outfits at best. And outfits I'm talking about didn't even match, right? Right. Uh, no Louis Vuittons, of course. <laughs> uh, no Gucci. But it was, it was a simple life. And sometimes I miss it because... I can get caught up in the comparison of, of trying to, hey, you know, you, you pull up on a stop sign, you, you look over, and there's a nice Ferrari. You're like, that'd be kind of nice to have right now. Like, what else do I need to go do to make that happen? Right. Um, but it's the simple life. Um, there's a cool little story. I remember it was, so this rich dad wants to teach his son about how poor people live. Okay. So he says, we're going to go out into this, this poor country. We're going to live with this family for a couple of days. I want you to be able to just experience it. And the son's like, okay, dad, thanks. Well, a couple of days goes by and the trip's over. And so they're driving home. And so the dad looks at the son and says, well, tell me, what did you learn? And the son says, well, I learned that they had, we have one dog and they have four dogs and we have a really nice pool in our backyard, but they have a river that stretches for miles and miles and we have a nice piece of land, but they have acres and acres of land, Dad. And they have, they have, um, we, we, we can go buy nice food, but they grow their own food and it's fresh. And they have walls to, pro- we have walls to protect them, but they have their friends to protect them. And we have servants to serve us, but they serve each other. And his dad at this point is just speechless, right? And, and the son looks at his dad and says, thanks, Dad, for teaching me how poor we are. And again, it comes back to what do you want in life? Like success is, is just feeling love, being loved, and being able to be surrounded by the people you love mm-hmm. and seeing your close knit a circle progressing, progressing towards things that make them happy. So everyone's yeah. going to define success differently. you got to find what works for you. Yeah. And I think that that's the most important thing is defining success for yourself and then 
going out and creating that. You know, like you like you mentioned, there's so many different things of success, but if we can really understand if it's like success is happiness, then it's our job to then go out and decide what happiness is. Yeah. And I think that that's the key to all of it is so often we just say success is happiness and people just stop there. Yeah. And they don't then go and create a plan, define it for themselves, um, and then create, you know, the discipline around making it happen. So, Absolutely. And as a dad, like happiness is providing for my family. That's yeah. a big deal. My oh, happiness. for sure. It's when my kids want something, I'm able to provide it for it. Yep. It's it's rewarding. But I don't I don't know of anybody who on their deathbed said, gosh, I wish I would have worked a little bit harder. Yeah. Not yeah, once has sure. anyone ever said that. Yeah. So, but no, and ultimately we've always been talking about books. Like I hope my books just make it out there, it becomes a household name. That to me, that's gonna be super satisfying because the amount of sacrifice and work that went into it. And like you said, the amount of people that that would mean that you had touched with with your creativity and with uh, the words that you do. So we're so excited. At the time that this is going to come out, your book will be out. Yes. So tell everybody how we can get on, you know, get to know you as an author, buy your books, all of that. Yeah. So it's they're both will be on Amazon and bookstores. So basically wherever books are sold, you can buy it. Barnes and Noble, everywhere, right? So I know Amazon's just kind of the go-to place. You can easily find it there. So the first one I wrote was Flight of the Tooth Fairy. So if you have any kids that are still losing teeth that it's a love great book. the Tooth Fairy, yes. it describes her magic from start to finish, answers every question. And just her magical journey from the moment a kid loses a tooth to how how does she get inside? How does she even find the tooth, right? Not everybody puts underneath the pillow. Yeah. So what does she do with the tooth? So that's Fly the Tooth Fairy. And then the second one is I Hope You Will Know. And that one is the the, the wishes, the dreams you have for any loved one. Um, and like Carrie said, by the time this comes out, it'll already be at the bookstores on, on Amazon. And then you can follow me on Instagram, Jaron Allman. It's kind of tricky. Um, you can look it up later and look it on the thing. To, I'll spell it. Not like Allman, like the nut. Yep. Um, and like I said, one of my favorite people to follow on Instagram, your reels are amazing. I try. I have very creative. No, that, that, cause I do mortgages and then we do a lot of business consulting for right. my, my day job. Cause books doesn't sell. It just costs me money at this point, <laughs> but it was, how can I create more awareness about it? Yeah. And I just got into reels and I absolutely love it. It's more like the transitional reels, not like here's three videos splot. Yep. It's more like the smooth transitions. And it, again, it comes down to creativity. It, it generally makes me happy and excited. Like what else can I make? It's super fun. It's super fun. And you're definitely going to want to follow him on Instagram. But thank you so much for being here. I have just so loved, you know, being able to be friends recently and be able to have somebody to talk to about books and things. So thank you so much for being here and we'll catch you next time. Thank you, Karen. Thanks for listening to this podcast episode. If you're ready to get in the driver's seat of your own life, you can come and follow me at Drive Your Thoughts Coaching on Instagram or come and see more ways to work with me at driveyourthoughts.com. Yeah, whether ready or not, life's coming hard, no breaks, no stop. And if you put me on the spot, don't get it twisted, I never drop. If you feel a bit out of control and out the box, here's a way that you could drive your thoughts. Turn this podcast on, it's a lock. Kerry Marshall on the clock.